Hey everyone, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, welcome to the last day of KubeCon. Uh, I'm super excited to be here and uh, sitting on the other side of the podium is really curious uh, for me. So thank you all for having me here today. So who am I? Uh, my name is Jonathan Pulsifer. I'm an infrastructure security engineer at Shopify, certified Kubernetes administrator, uh, number 89, if that means anything. You can find me on uh, GitHub and, uh, and Twitter at John Pulsifer. Previously, I was a team lead at the Canadian Forces Network Operations Center. That's where I got some of my security operations experience and donned my tinfoil hat. Uh, network defense instructor at the Canadian Forces School of Communications and Electronics, and I did some work for SANS, uh, some construction, and so some packet analysis and all that stuff. So I am a certified packet ninja. So thank you for, again for having me on stage today. Uh, my first KubeCon was back earlier this year in Berlin, where I was sitting on the floor watching uh, Jesse Frizzell and Alex Moore talk about securing uh, GKE clusters, or securing the Kubernetes clusters. So I'm really glad that the venue has a little bit larger room uh, than, uh, than they did in Berlin, so that's fantastic. Fun fact, uh, for those who didn't know, the Kubernetes store, the CNCF store, actually runs on uh, Kubernetes at Shopify, so that's really interesting. Uh, I went and talked to the uh, folks who were running the booth down there and uh, let them know that they should be letting you know that if you purchase anything, you're actually purchasing something uh, through Kubernetes. It was one of the actual first doors that we moved to our uh, cloud platform uh, at Shopify. So before I start talking about security controls and how we do this, first we need to gather some more context about how we run services at Shopify. So we have what's called a service tier model, where uh, as an application sort of moves through the software development lifecycle, we start off at uh, tier four, where we have a lot fewer requirements. You know, it encourages that rapid prototyping, really gets agility in there. And as we move through, uh, through business importance, uh, we, we impose things like service level objectives and, and the traditional sort of software development life cycling controls and uh, impose things like page rotations, uh, CI, uh, alerting, uh, redundancy, incident response, these sorts of things. And so when we were moving to Kubernetes and setting up all of our clusters and I was thinking, why don't we do the same thing with security? So. Uh, I've coined uh, what I've called the security tiers. So uh, first and foremost, when, when you create an application on our cloud platform uh, on tier four, we impose things like strict RBAC, uh, Kredis attestations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more, more about what those are later. But as we move through the tiers, I, I have this vision, if I were to have one, of uh, restricting uh, the, the runtime of containers with SecComp, AppArmor, the network policies, strict security context, uh, dropping all the container capabilities, and these sorts of things. So this is the vision that, that I have uh, for doing this on, on my team. So we're going to explore a little bit of how we do this. So how many namespaces do we have? How many clusters do we have? What does it look like? So uh, Kubernetes namespaces by tier. Uh, we have about 60 namespaces in tier one across a number of clusters. Tier two, we're about 70. In total, about 450 namespaces uh, operationally for services running at Shopify on GKE right now. So that's pretty outstanding. How does a team of uh, seven cloud security individuals uh, maintain sanity and sleep at night with this many namespaces running amok. And uh, it's important to know that um, as we move to Kubernetes, we're not there yet. We're still in, uh, I guess, an exploratory phase. Uh, we've moved most of our internal applications over, but it just should be noted that we still have two data centers which are very much hot, and we're exploring some Kubernetes there, but we're actually gonna be focusing on GKE for the portion of this talk. So I'd like to introduce our cloud platform. Our cloud platform is running on GKE, as I said again. We have about 600 projects in Google Cloud Platform today, uh, maintained by 15 folders, uh, 700 Google Groups, and 20 GKE clusters. So this isn't like the running one service per cluster idea. We, we, have, a, we have a number of clusters uh, in, in a number of production projects which serve a lot of traffic. So that's uh, some numbers for you. With that many clusters and this many um, resources that we have to control, does security work when you have to rely on people to do things correctly? Uh, obvious answer here is a big no, right? So uh, it's important that as we, as we scale our operations, as we scale our clusters, as we scale the, all this, we need to introduce these, uh, these, um, these, this automation uh, into, our, into our platform so we can actually maintain agility uh, with our developers, a thousand active developers at Shopify, and how do we uh, give them that Heroku sort of feel? How do we, how do we let them um, push code? And how do we then uh, secure those running containers? 
So this is a general overview of our cloud platform architecture. And what we're going to do is we're going to step through uh, a number of components here. And we're going to introduce uh, not the operational patterns, the operational automation, because it's not the focus of this talk. It's going to be the security automation here. So at, at each sort of uh, stage in this process, we have our traditional, I guess, everybody has a builder, right? CI and CD is not new. There's been a lot of talks on this. But there hasn't been a lot of talks on introducing security controls into those pipelines. So we're going to step through those and see what they mean. So we're going to start off with services DB. So services DB is this uh, sort of front end for services at Shopify, where we have about 300, 400 uh, services that run. And how do we uh, visualize, or how do we make sure that uh, everybody has their, uh, their their playbook set up? How do we make sure that their logs are there? You know, where, how can we uh, visualize this? And this is a tool called services DB. Uh, I'm not going to uh, focus much on uh, the actual uh, front ending of, of operations again, but uh, with services DB, because it has sort of the application context, this is the first, the first place where an application sort of begins its life cycling. You have a repo and you sign up for services DB and then we can do some, do some things like automatic patching. So on the right hand side here, you see we have this, uh, this robot who's uh, creating a pull request uh, on my repository that says, uh, hey John, your Shopify cloud gem is out of date, so you should probably get that patched. We're a big Ruby shop, uh, Shopify, so uh, most of the most of the um, uh, automation we have built in for our dependencies uh, revolve around Ruby. So this is an example of one of those where we actually provide our developers who are building Ruby on Rails applications with a gem, the Shopify Cloud gem, with, which builds in some more uh, operational automation as well as uh, things like um, providing uh, good patterns around, say, uh, storage. For example, is a good example of that. So with this. Uh, we actually, when we have a repository and we click or create service runtime, create cloud runtime, it's actually going to do a lot of magic in the back end. And this is ground control. And ground control is really curious because we use this to uh, assign sort of uh, identity to our namespaces. While we wait for, and we've heard of the container identity working group and Spiffy, and we're, we're, we're getting to a point where we can then uh, attach identity to a pod or a container, we can't do that today. So how did we do this at Shopify is where we actually gave identity to the namespace. So when you create your cloud runtime with services DB, what's going to happen is we're going to create you a GCP service account that's going to be bound to your sort of namespace environment pair. And we're going to mount that secret for you inside uh, your Kubernetes namespace. Uh, at the same time, we're going to provision you an eJSON key pair. So what's eJSON? So go check it out. It's actually open sourced. It's called Encrypted JSON. It allows us to uh, use asymmetric encryption techniques to keep our secrets inside of a Git repository so that we can actually uh, have those uh, secrets encrypted in there. And when we deploy to our Kubernetes namespace, it actually decrypts that runtime. So we don't need to uh, worry about these secrets being baked into containers, right? That, that bad anti-pattern that sort of, sort of has come up over, uh, over uh, the years. And uh, we can avoid this by using Encrypted JSON. So if we have an encrypted file full of secrets in there, who cares, right? But with this, we actually get the auditing for version control on all the secrets. So if somebody goes in, checks in a secret, we can see who did that when. So that's really unique. And, uh, and we also annotate the namespace with like uh, your, your GitHub and sort of who, who owns this, where does this repo come from, and give a little bit more context uh, to that. So now that we've taken a repository and we've sort of built its Kubernetes groundwork with ground control, how do we get your container built? So this is the fun piece. At Shopify, we do about 6,000 builds average on weekday. This is not like uh, container builds going into production. This is uh, everything from CI. This is, this is our, our overall builder stat. So we, so we build about 6,000 uh, containers per weekday. Uh, life cycling is really hard. So we have about 450,000 images in GCR today. And uh, that has given us and the folks uh, doing the GCR vulnerability scanning, a little bit of load testing help uh, because as they're, as they're building these, these products to help us out, uh, the amount of, of, of containers that we're actually shoving in there uh, is actually giving us a hard time. So there's a little bit of a latency problem there, but we're going to chat about <laughs> that a little bit later. So our builder is called PIPA. And our builders uh, run on BuildKite, you saw uh, previously. So PIPA in Portuguese actually means kite, so that's where that name came from. And it's a Docker in Docker, uh, Golang uh, creature that does a lot of uh, discovery. So what I mean by that is if you have a repository as a developer, should you understand explicitly how to build a Docker container? I mean, arguably no. So what can we do here to help get a secure container into production? 
So with Pipa, what it actually does is it discovers, using the same Heroku build pack model, what code lives inside of your repository and will provision you the appropriate uh, build packs needed uh, for your application to run. So on the right-hand side here, you see the sort of build kite uh, screenshot there and a couple different, uh, different stages of our pipeline. So we have a pipeline set up, we trigger a, val a validation build, and we build your container. At the very bottom, you see this Grafeus and Creedy stuff. And we're going to chat about that next. But with our builder, it's important to know that when it comes to building a container, and, and actually building that container is when you have the most context as to what's going to be run inside of that container, right? You see the packages being installed, you see the versions of the build packs, you know, you, you have the most context. So this is where we can actually do a lot of our disco initial discovery and, and auditing and actually sort of check out what's going on, right? So we can actually do some audits like, does this, can, does this image run as root? Does this image contain any vulnerable packages and container attestations? So what are container attestations? What does this mean? I want to talk about Grafeus and Credes. If y'all have seen the uh, sessions that have been going on, there's been a couple on Grafeus, and uh, Grafeus and Credes has really been a, a large focus for the cloud security team for the last little while. So uh, Grafeus is a software component metadata API where it allows us to store uh, details or m metadata about a given software package, right? You can have a deb, an RPM, these sorts of things, but isn't a container just an image that we could also have metadata for? Absolutely, right? So using the, the namespace and uh, image and the digest as the key, we can actually uh, produce what's called a note at build, so we can sort of start this, uh, this, 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 this chain of provenances, who, who created this container, when was it built, uh, you know, what, what, um, what other, uh, is it deployed in production right now, and these other uh, pieces that uh, we have context for at build time. So we produce these notes at build, and if you actually use Google Container Builder, uh, you get all this stuff for free on the inside, which is sort of neat. So as a, as a personal customer, I've actually, I, I didn't know this, but uh, you know, building my own containers and my own personal projects, I said, okay, well, well, what is this stuff? What does this look like? On the right-hand side here, we see uh, what's called an occurrence of, uh, or a, a note of uh, a package vulnerability. So with Grafeus, uh, it's just metadata, right? So we can actually start pushing things like vulnerabilities there. So you see this is a, a TCP dump 490 package that's vulnerable and it's fixed in version 492. So if we have this information about this TCP dump package at container build, we know that we're installing a version of TCP dump in a container. On the other side, then we can say, hey, look, this container, this specific container contains this package with this vulnerability, right? It's that, it's that container introspection. And that's where uh, Grafeus is, is really powerful for keeping that container metadata. So if you want to learn more about that, check out uh, Google Cloud's blog or Shopify's engineering blog. I wrote a little post about how we use that. Metadata is one thing, but Credis, or as you'll hear if you hit the Grafeus repository, binary authorization is really the, the, the cool piece. So it's using this metadata that's stored in Grafeus to actually create and enforce policies at runtime. So this uh, binary authorization means that uh, we're going to step back here and show you at the very bottom, you see this Grafeus and, and Creedy stuff. What we're doing in there is actually uh, taking the, the digest of our container, we're signing it digitally, and then we're pushing that uh, back into, uh, into the Creedy's sort of binary authorization API. And what we're going to do here is then make sure that we can deploy no image other than the images which have been built by us, which is really unique because this sort of takes away the idea of, of an adversary gaining access to your cluster and downloading their own container and running their own tools, right? And that's, that could be described as bad, and we don't like bad. So we, we like to uh, enforce these uh, with Kubernetes. There was actually a demo at the, uh, at the BOF talk uh, for uh, Grafeus of this actually working with a emission controller, which is awesome. So now that we have our repository checked in, our Kubernetes primitives started, we have our container built, how do we actually deploy this uh, to production? So Kubernetes deploy is really cool. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a gem uh, that provides us a lot of automation around deployment to Kubernetes. It's actually open source, so go check it out. It's a, essentially a plugin for our, our build tool called Shipit, which is also open source. So you can go check those things out and see how we deploy to Kubernetes. But the, the main features that are, are really exciting uh, for me and for our developers is that we have the clear, actionable, pass-fail results, right? Green is good, red is bad. And we, we, we do things like uh, the, the pre-deployment of certain resources, right? Like you have to deploy a service before a workload so that you can uh, have the appropriate environment variables, these sorts of things. Now we do a little bit of that. And the decryption of the eJSON is what's, what's happening here. So what we can do with Kubernetes deploy, since we 
built all these tools, they all, have the, 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 they all have the context, is we can actually put this other structure inside of eJSON to say, create me a Kubernetes secret from this blob named this. And this is, this is really cool because then we can keep these secrets inside of version control and then deploy them to crypt them at runtime so we don't need to worry about uh, any of uh, that plain text secrets and stuff. And there's a few other uh, checks in there as well. Uh, so like we can't overwrite uh, cube system, for example, or delete cube public, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, some, some, checks in, some checks in there to, to help us out. But there's an example of me deploying a, a little uh, Go app. So you deployed in 4.2 seconds, it's good, it's green success, and we're all happy. All right, so this is an example of uh, some of the automation that we have here around getting secrets uh, into the appropriate namespaces or inside of our containers. Oh, it's black. Works for me. Let's try it again. Cannot reproduce, that's right. Wiggle, wiggle. Hey! You just tapped it, uh, tapped the input with your foot. Oh, yes. My fault. Always. <laughs> Thank you so much. So stepping back to Kubernetes Deploy. Uh, Kubernetes Deploy, uh, TLDR, gives us uh, clear, actionable, pass-fail results. Uh, also decrypts us our secrets uh, from eJSON into Kubernetes and uh, really uh, helps us with that developer experience. So um, if we have robots deploying for us, this has actually prevented us from having to give our developers kubectl access, which is really unique. So uh, with a thousand active developers, uh, them wanting control over their infrastructure is uh, is a really big deal. And you know, given that uh, with Heroku, you sort of you can you can get a little bit more intimate with your application. We we built tools like Kubernetes Deploy, and another one which I'm not going to show, but I'll talk about is uh, is Cube Shell, which will actually. Uh, sort of preclude us from having to give kubectl access to our developers, which is really awesome. With kubeshell, what we can do is actually, uh, with tty.js and a little bit of OAuth, we can actually give them a terminal into their own namespaces with access provisioned uh, via config map. So we don't actually want to, uh, want to explicitly uh, give uh, all of our users that admin access and, and deal with, with our backend that way. So with kubeshell, we can actually provision a little bit differently. So this is where the fun automation begins. We're going to talk about our Cloud Buddies. So Cloud Buddies, uh, internally marketed as friendly Kubernetes controllers, keeping the cloud fluffy, are, is, our, is our brand for our Kubernetes controllers that we built. Uh, there's a lot of them. About 15 of them run per cluster. It depends given the type of services that run there. But this is where we can introduce our service automation or security automation. So we have things like uh, Redis Buddy, for example, Memcached Buddy, you know, that would provision you an appropriate uh, resource uh, under whatever circumstance uh, that we've decided to build. But the ones that we've decided to build for security and, or implement security controls in and that I want to talk about are Accountability Buddy, Bucket Buddy, Nepal Buddy, RBAC Buddy, and Secret Buddy. So it's, uh, it's pretty fun. Here's an example of what uh, Accountability Buddy is, is designed to do. So remember when we created our Kubernetes namespace and assigned identity to it with the GCP service account? It's how do we give access to a given Google API to that service account without uh, somebody pinging me and having me to go in and manually sort of click some buttons there? That's not very scalable as we deploy a lot of applications to our cluster. So if they just drop a config map in the repo and say, hey, I want to give this service account, now say container viewer, well, we can do this. And we do have some checks in accountability, but you, you, can't, you can't give yourself sort of God mode on the entire project, right? Like this, uh, this is something that we've accounted for and we don't want to do. But we do have some APIs which we will, will very happily uh, allow you to check into to version control and, and allow us to provision that access for you. So this is how uh, the seven of us sort of maintain uh, sanity moving forward with this. With uh, storage, again, every developer would like access to their storage. And since we uh, use G Suite uh, for our, our, our our actual sort of business products, we can actually leverage that identity on Google Cloud Platform 
And then uh, with, uh, with Bucket Buddy in this example, there's an example of a custom resource where uh, we are giving storage admin to a robot and to a group and giving uh, object creator uh, to you at Shopify.com. So again, with all of this in version control, this allows our security team to actually then audit who requested these permissions when, and we have that, we have that trail, right? Of course, there's that, oh, well, anybody can sign, change your identity and, and get, and that's all good. You know, this is a way that, uh, that, that helps us early on build that auditing into our platform, and which is really unique. So uh, with this, then we can, we can assign appropriate uh, permissions. Auditing clusters are hard, especially when we have 20 of them. So how do we ensure that uh, all of our workloads are running, uh, running securely? When I started down this road, I said, well, the tools didn't really exist at the time. I said, how do I effectively audit this cluster to make sure that my workloads are, are running securely? And this is where Cubata came in. We actually have a, a couple dedicated uh, developers on this now. We open sourced it very recently. And this is just a little uh, Golang application that allows us to perform audits against arbitrary security controls on Kubernetes. So we can audit for things like automount service account token. We can make sure that the appropriate image and tags are running. Uh, you, see, you can see an example in the top right there. I just took a screen cap of the terminal. We do have some human readable output, but we also put in JSON so we can automate this. Uh, we can audit uh, for network policies to make sure that you have appropriate default deny policies in there. And uh, every control under security context we can also audit for. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, John, this image has been determined to be vulnerable, what can we do? Well, we can just quickly run a little Qbot check to make sure that we're not running that image anywhere. This is probably going to go away or be integrated with Grafeus once this uh, becomes a little bit more, mm, once Grafeus becomes a little bit more fleshed out and productionized. Uh, but this is a, a really easy way uh, for us to do this today and, uh, and get some answers very quickly. There's this other continuous security monitoring piece that, that we're missing. So with 600 projects, uh, scaling is really hard. So we have developed a couple tools inside uh, to help us out with this. So there's this, a tool called Nosy Bastard, uh, which does a scheduled scanning. It's our, like our traditional sort of VA or our ZMAP, NMAP, uh, Nessus scans. It does some discovery of cloud resources on GCP, on AWS, on Heroku, and our other operating environments, which is pretty cool. And we also decided as we moved uh, towards a really strict RBAC uh, control clusters, uh, we needed some sort of visualization there to help us out and look at, look at this to see which, uh, which service accounts are mapped to which roles and these sorts of things. And we built that into Nosy Bastard so we can actually go and clickety-click and see which RBAC roles are assigned to which service account, which is really awesome. Uh, for steady security, if y'all haven't checked that out and are using GCP, uh, please do. It is just really, really good comprehensive GCP inventory, and there's been a lot of horsepower behind it over the last little while. And we use this for the uh, discovery of, of other resources and also the enforcement of IAM policies, which is awesome. So we can make sure that uh, if you or a developer at Shopify creates a new project, they can't add any external identities to that project, for an example. We found that using GKE, and the concept of the MIG or the managed instance group, that these nodes come up and go down a lot. And moving from a traditional sort of config managed, uh, chef, Ansible sort of environment, you know, where we had to ship around SSH keys and these sorts of things, that's not really something that we want to do. So the Google accounts daemon that's actually running on the container optimized OS will actually provision you access uh, via SSH by taking the SSH keys out of the project metadata and adding them to the authorized key so you can SSH into it. And if you haven't done it, gcloud compute SSH, ticka, 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 and bang, you're in a server, right? But where are these keys held? How can we manage them? Do we have to? Uh, that's sort of arguable, right? So our Google accounts today are actually backed by multi-factor authentication, right? So if you want to talk to Google Cloud Platform API, you gotta, you got to sign in. So we already have some controls around identity there. So accessing a cluster via SSH or accessing a node via SSH this is all backed by our G Suite identities today, which is, again, backed by MFA. So do we have to ship these identities around? These SSH keys, if you don't have one provision, if you don't specify one, it will create an ephemeral key for you. So what if we just delete these all the time? And then you have to provision them again and again. It doesn't take too long. How often are we actually SSHing into a GKE node? Not very often. So given that, we can uh, build a tool called SSH Janitor to go in and discover and delete these stale project-wide SSH keys. So every time that we have to log in, we got to do that little dance. Eh, maybe it takes like 30 seconds, something like this. But it's really not that big of a deal if we can actually reduce that, uh, reduce that threat by uh, having these stale SSH keys around, right? We have to provision them all the time on the fly. 
which is really cool. So what's missing? People at Google.com, please don't hate me. We were missing, at the time that I wrote this talk, a lot of things. But Kubernetes moves so fast, and given that like GKE is, uh, is open source Kubernetes, plus a couple bells and whistles, you know, we haven't, we've actually scratched a lot of these off. So for the longest time, we actually didn't have access to the API server logs because Google hosts the master for us, right? So given that, how do you get these logs? kubectl proxy, curl the kube API server log endpoint, and pipe it out to a file and do some other things. You know, that wasn't available to us. But as of uh, GK173, it's actually in cloud audit logging now, which is phenomenal. Uh, network policies are finally here uh, with Calico, which is great as of GK176. Our egress network policies work as of 184, which is really good for us. We're still missing pod security policies. I've been poking for a long time. I can't set my cluster-wide pod security policy. Now, why is that important? Why is that important enough to grab a slide? Because we have, what, 300 services maybe deployed there now? So if, if in Kubernetes 1.8, we have the new, uh, the new flag in the security context called allowed privilege escalation, right? So how do I ensure that allowed privilege escalation is set to false in all my containers and all my workload manifests? Well, that's a couple hundred PRs. Uh, I would really just like to do that once. So that's really where that comes from. The IAM and RBAC synchronization has been really, really fun for us. Not. Uh, so on GKE, we have a couple different authorizers. We have the, the webhooker, the IAM uh, authorizer, and we have the RBAC authorizer. So for those who don't know, when you make a request against the API server, we have this long list of authorizers, and if any one of them succeeds, the request will succeed. So if I don't have an appropriate RBAC role matching uh, Jonathan to for Shopify.com, but I've provisioned myself access through IAM, my request will succeed. I can get my pods, I can list my, you know, list my nodes, these sorts of things, but I'm gonna see RBAC failures keep showing up in the API server log. We page on RBAC failures in the cloud security team, and this has been, this has been quite the journey for us, uh, for us in this. So we're really missing that IAM and RBAC synchronization. That would be uh, super awesome if that could exist. Uh, the GLBC uh, configuration options for the identity aware proxy. I know stuff's in the work there, but I would really like to enable the identity aware proxy because we are a big users of the Google Cloud load balancer. So the GLBC, if I could configure some IP there, that'd be sweet. And container identity, I crossed it out. Uh, it, it's not here yet, but you know we've we've seen all the work going on with the container identity working groups, and uh, and I have faith that it will show up at some point in the future. So that's all I have for you today. I'm ready for any questions. Thank you. Um, how do you handle cross-cluster communication in different projects? Cross-cluster communication in different projects? That's a little hairy. So, uh, the, yeah. We, so uh, I mentioned we have we have four service tiers, right? Tier one, two, three, four. There's actually a couple of other ones that I didn't really mention. Uh, one is uh, tier shared, and tier shared is that uh, sort of providing access like Splunk and Zookeepers and these sorts of things, uh, Kafka. And how do we how do we connect to that? We don't actually connect any other way than we would normally. So we'll still front it with an appropriate load balancer and we'll still do TLS uh, in the front and client sort off and these sorts of things. So we're still using like the same traditional uh, login methods that we'd have used before. If this was running in the DC, we'd use the same method. Maybe an extra sort of TCP tunnel on there just for funsies, but that's... Like the no or or we haven't really played with that yet. So we're really looking forward to the, uh, what's called IP alias clusters, right? Where we can actually make uh, the pods and service first class citizens on Andromeda like that. that that's really cool. It's, we haven't done it yet, but we're looking forward to exploring that when it comes. So right now we're just sort of biding our time until that happens. Yeah, Kubernetes deploy. So yeah, so you're guessing the Kubernetes deploy has access to the project? We, 
we, we protect those keys the same way that we protect any other key, and that would be, uh, at Shopify we have what's called the default to open culture, so typically our engineers have access to all the things, and given that, like, they're still held in encrypted JSON and deployed the same way that we would deploy any other app, so it, it's, it's, just, it's just another key, a secret's a secret to a secret. I, I mean, we do have auditing ar around this, so you know, if we would determine that it could have been compromised, we just roll it, and with IAM, it's just super easy. You can spit another JSON, kind of good to go, right? And we do have auditing through GCP there. Does that answer your question? No, there, there, there's, there's no, not like a, a monthly rotation. It's more whenever we feel like like it would need. If something if something has gone awry, then then we would do that. But if there's no indication that it keeps been compromised, the, there's rotating it is, I don't know, to provide much value. I think. It's not like, so the question was if we have like feature parity of sort of cloud trail there. It's, it's not the same, but our model's like very much different now. Like moving in GKE, like all of our, all of our um, cluster operations are logged appropriately through cloud audit logging, right? And we're satisfied with this. Uh, but like other like in cluster sort of operations, app level operations, that's all Kubernetes now. So it's, it's sort of like build your own auditing, I, I guess, if that makes sense. Our, our, we use Splunk for our, our logging pipeline, so we're going to hit the, the Fluentd aggregators kind of Kafka Splunk. That would just be our, our ideal pattern, so nothing really changes there for us. Like when we venture into multi cloud, I don't really see any, any huge differences. So the question was, uh, we still have a number of applications running in our data centers, and what were the pains sort of moving to GKE? Operationally, I can't really speak to this, uh, but security-wise, it's it's all about the snowflakes, right? So not, not every app is the same. Uh, a Python application is built differently than a Ruby on Rails application, so we've... We've tried to stick to that build packs model and tried to introduce as many controls as we can there, but some applications are different, so we've actually had to walk teams through appropriately building a Docker container or just keeping keeping on top of these things because not every app's the same. I, it's more of like an operational question, I guess, sort of migration there, but um, as an infrastructure security engineer, like traditionally everything below the app in a stack, now it's like everything below the app in a Docker container, right? So it's almost, almost not my problem, <laughs> if that makes sense. Is that your question? Cool. So the question is, how is the GCP uh, uh, sort of identity that we've provisioned for this namespace actually consumed by services? So uh, when we, at, at the beginning in the services DB, when we click create cloud runtime, and that's when all that stuff is provisioned, we actually mount that secret uh, in Kubernetes and then provide that sort of a, as a volume mount, uh, you know, sort of secret volume mount inside the container, the Google application credentials, you know, the typical place for this, this credential file is where we would, we would mount the path to that. And we provide this in the workload manifest sort of for everybody. We have like a number of blessed stacks, right? So, you know, for, for the snowflakes, it doesn't really work. But if you're deploying like a Rails application, and everything's going to work magically for you. And that's sort of that's what we give. The, we haven't done any really like YAML templating, like any templating like I've mentioned before. So that's a little bit hairy. Some manifests are quite long. But um, this is where we can mount those for our developers. So they don't have to worry about these things. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, this, so this is the difference between the Kubernetes service accounts and the GCP service accounts. They're both like completely, completely separate. So the GCP service account is used to talk to the GCP APIs, and we mount that complete, distinctly as a secret. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Sorry. For, yeah, so the question is like, when we do our automated patching, do we actually, is it fully automated or does a developer have to actually 
like a button. And sometimes they do. Some, you know, some, for example, like a gem bump or something like this, something that we're more confident with automatically patching. Yeah, they're, they're going to go through and be merged automatically. But that's that's a risk, right? If if we're serving production off there, says, oh, here's your patch, boom, boom, push it through, like, and it breaks. Well, it's I, I don't want to be responsible for that, <laughs> you know. So. Yeah, it, Not really yet. I mean, we're st we're still pretty young in our in our Kubernetes journey, so it's. Uh, I would assume next year, asking the same question, it'll be different. But um, but right now, no. There's still some some manual steps required, and like our yeah, our container vulnerability scanning, it's all reactive right now. We can't do it fast enough to put it in the CI and make it worthwhile for us. So uh, our, is accountability open sourced and do we have a plan for it? Um, a lot of the buddies that we actually have are really sort of contextually bound to Shopify in our patterns. So it doesn't really make much sense for us to open source those right now. We thought about it. Um, you may see some buddies show up uh, in the future, but right now they're sort of all mono repoed. So it doesn't make sense for us to open source or really componentize those right now. <laughs> so, so you want it, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, that's uh, that's great to hear. That's great feedback. Uh, I love that sort of feedback. And if I can push that, uh, I will. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was going to explain a little bit more about why we don't give uh, Kubectl access to the devs and. It's more about management, I guess, at this time. So rewind back a year, and it was myself and, and, and a couple others doing the cloud security stuff. So how do we do effective RBAC for 1,000 devs at the same time, sort of automatically? And that was sort of a, like a design decision that we had to make. And did we want to expose or teach uh, Kubernetes to developers? Maybe next year, you know, but, but to keep us moving fast and to keep actually services being created, you know, and, and not having to pause and learn Kubernetes has actually been a really big win for us. So we, we uh, over the last couple of days, we had our company hack days, and which is two days where we just, you know, build the things that are cool. And uh, I think we have like 50 or 60 different applications now deployed to that cluster, and that's it's pretty phenomenal that they can do that without having to worry about the Kubernetes patterns, right? They can just click through it and have their storage and have the Redis and, you know, do all the things. We, we do actually spend a lot of time uh, supporting deployments. Uh, we, we have uh, what's called a cloud help rotation. So uh, we, we go through and some of us will swap out and actually provide sort of front end uh, support to the devs who are onboarding onto the cloud platform. And uh, us on the security team actually do that as well. So we can actually um, course correct if necessary if we see any sort of anti-patterns showing up there, which, is, which has been really helpful for us. But yeah, we do provide sort of cloud platform front end support. Yeah. Oh, sorry, right in front of me. Um, how are you handling the image scans? Handling the image scans? It's all GCR vulnerability scanner is, is the main tool that we use for that. And uh, right now we're just, we can pull out uh, if containers are vulnerable or not via the G Cloud uh, command line utility or hit the API or in the GUI. So that's all, but again, it's all reactive right now because of the latency. Say again? I would love to do it on deploy. It's just, again, when we had that 450K images in GCR, like we're really hammering the API and we're giving them a hard time as much as they are us. So it's, uh, it's reactive for sure. Are you, are you seeing a lot of duplicate images or, or things being kind of the same services being deployed? Yeah, the question is, do we see a lot of like duplicate images or like the same sort of services? And absolutely we do, yeah. Like a lot of applications aren't too dissimilar, right? So we do actually provide uh, blessed uh, base images to start, start this off and that sort of where we make those decisions. But yeah, there's a lot of duplication. We thought, of, we thought about injecting stuff into the image uh, after deploy, but um, again, we're following that Heroku model. So heroku in the build packs really just, it works and it works well. So uh, we're gonna stick with it, I think. Anything else? Yep. Yeah. So uh, how are we handling alerting? Uh, alerting on what? 
I guess. Uh, the, the thing that I mentioned was we page on our back failures. So we're actually looking for like returns like on, on round tripper for our back failures, and we're, we're digesting the application level logs out of anything that contacts Kubernetes API, for example, and just alerting standardly through pager duty as we would. Yeah. A regular logging pipeline sort of sort of stuff. Cool. Well thank you so much everyone.